Two great mysteries dominate our lives, love and money. What is love is a question that has been endlessly explored in stories, songs, books, movies, and television. But the same cannot be said about the question, what is money? It's not surprising that monetary theory hasn't inspired any blockbuster movies, but it was not even mentioned at the schools most of us attended. For most of us, the question, where does money come from, brings to mind a picture of the mint printing bills and stamping coins. Money, most of us believe, is created by the government. It's true, but only to a point. Those metal and paper symbols of value we usually think of as money are indeed produced by an agency of the federal government called the Mint. But the vast majority of money is not created by the Mint. It is created in huge amounts every day by private corporations known as banks. Most of us believe that banks lend out money that has been entrusted to them by depositors. Easy to picture, but not the truth. In fact, banks create the money they loan, not from the bank's own earnings, not from the money deposited, but directly from the borrower's promise to repay. The borrower's signature on the loan papers is an obligation to pay the bank the amount of the loan plus interest, or lose the house, the car, whatever asset was pledged as collateral. That's a big commitment from the borrower. What does the same signature require of the bank? The bank gets to conjure into existence the amount of the loan and just write it into the borrower's account. Sound far-fetched? Surely that can't be true. But it is. To demonstrate how this miracle of modern banking came about, consider this simple story, The Goldsmith's Tale. Once upon various times, pretty much anything was used as money. It just had to be portable, and enough people had to have faith that it could later be exchanged for things of real value, like food, clothing, and shelter. Shells, cocoa beans, pretty stones, even feathers have been used as money. Gold and silver were attractive, soft, and easy to work with, so some cultures became expert with these metals. Goldsmiths made trade much easier by casting coins, standardized units of these metals whose weight and purity was certified. Well, to protect his gold, the goldsmith needed a vault, and soon his fellow townsmen were knocking on his door, wanting to rent space to safeguard their own coins and valuables. Before long, the goldsmith was renting every shelf in the vault and earning a small income from his vault rental business. Years went by, and the goldsmith made an astute observation. Depositors rarely came in to remove their actual physical gold, and they never all came in at once. That was because the claim checks the goldsmith had written as receipts for the gold were being traded in the marketplace as if they were the gold itself. This paper money was far more convenient than heavy coins, and amounts could simply be written instead of laboriously counted one by one for each transaction. Meanwhile, the goldsmith had another business. He lent out his gold, charging interest. While his convenient claim check money came into acceptance, borrowers began asking for their loans in the form of these claim checks instead of the actual metal. As industry expanded, more and more people asked the goldsmith for loans. This gave the goldsmith an even better idea. He knew that very few of his depositors ever removed their actual gold, so the goldsmith figured he could easily get away with lending out claim checks against his depositors' gold in addition to his own. As long as the loans were repaid, his depositors would be none the wiser and no worse off. And the goldsmith, now more banker than artisan, would make a far greater profit than he could by lending only his own gold. For years, the goldsmith secretly enjoyed a good income from the interest earned on everybody else's deposits. Now a prominent lender, he grew steadily richer than his fellow townsmen, and he flaunted it. Suspicions grew that he was spending his depositors money. His depositors got together and threatened withdrawal of their gold if the goldsmith didn't come clean about his newfound wealth. Contrary to what one might expect, this did not turn out to be a disaster for the goldsmith. Despite the duplicity inherent in his scheme, his idea did work. The depositors had not lost anything. Their gold was all safe in the goldsmith's vault. 
Well, rather than taking back their gold, the depositors demanded that the goldsmith, now their banker, cut them in by paying them a share of the interest. And that was the beginning of banking. The banker paid a low interest rate on deposits of other people's money that he then loaned out at a higher interest. The difference covered the bank's cost of operation and its profit. The logic of this system was simple, and it seemed like a reasonable way to satisfy the demand for credit. However, this is not the way banking works today. Our goldsmith banker was not content with the income remaining after sharing the interest earnings with his depositors, and the demand for credit was growing fast as Europeans spread out across the world. But his loans were limited by the amount of gold his depositors had in his vault. That's when he got an even bolder idea. Since no one but himself knew what was actually in his vaults, he could lend out claim checks on gold that wasn't even there. As long as all the claim check holders didn't come to the vault at the same time and demand real gold, how would anyone find out? This new scheme worked very well, and the banker became enormously wealthy on the interest paid on gold that did not exist. The idea that the banker would just create money out of nothing was too outrageous to believe, so for a long time the thought did not occur to people. But the power to just invent money went to the banker's head, as you can well imagine. In time, the magnitude of the banker's loans and his ostentatious wealth did trigger suspicions once again. Some borrowers started to demand real gold instead of paper representations. Rumors spread. Suddenly, several wealthy depositors showed up to remove their gold. The game was up. A sea of claim check holders flooded the street outside the closed doors of the bank. Alas, the banker did not have enough gold and silver to redeem all the paper he had put into their hands. This is called a run on the bank, and it is what every banker dreads. This phenomenon of a run on the bank ruined individual banks and, not surprisingly, damaged public confidence in all bankers. It would have been straightforward to outlaw the practice of creating money from nothing. But the large volumes of credit the bankers were offering had become essential to the success of European commercial expansion. So instead, the practice was legalized and regulated. Bankers agreed to abide by limits on the amount of fictional loan money that could be lent out. The limit would still be a number much larger than the actual value of gold and silver in the vault. Quite often, the ratio was nine fictional dollars to one actual dollar in gold. These regulations were enforced by surprise inspections. It was also arranged that, in the event of a run, central banks would support local banks with emergency infusions of gold. Only if there were runs on a lot of banks simultaneously would the banker's credit bubble burst and the system come crashing down. Over the years, the fractional reserve system and its integrated network of banks backed by a central bank has become the dominant money system of the world. At the same time, the fraction of gold backing the debt money has steadily shrunk to nothing. The basic nature of money has changed. In the past, a paper dollar was actually a receipt that could be redeemed for a fixed weight of gold or silver. In the present, a paper or digital dollar can only be redeemed for another paper or digital dollar. In the past, privately created bank credit existed only in the form of private banknotes, which people had the choice to refuse, just as we have the choice to refuse someone's private check today. In the present, privately created bank credit is legally convertible to government-issued fiat currency, the dollars, loonies, and pounds we habitually think of as money. Fiat currency is money created by government fiat or decree, and legal tender laws declare that citizens must accept this fiat money as payment for debt or else the courts will not enforce the obligation. So now the question is, if governments and banks can both just create money, then how much money exists? In the past, 
the total amount of money in existence was limited to the actual physical quantities of whatever commodity was in use as money. For example, in order for new gold or silver money to be created, more gold or silver had to be found and dug out of the ground. In the present, money is literally created as debt. New money is created whenever anyone takes a loan from the bank. As a result, the total amount of money that can be created has only one real limit, the total level of debt. Governments place an additional statutory limit on the creation of new money by enforcing rules known as fractional reserve requirements. Essentially arbitrary, fractional reserve requirements vary from country to country and from time to time. In the past, it was common to require banks to have at least one dollar's worth of real gold in the vault to back ten dollars worth of debt money created. Today, reserve requirement ratios no longer apply to the ratio of new money to gold on deposit but merely to the ratio of new debt money to existing debt money on deposit in the bank. Today, a bank's reserves consist of two things. The amount of government-issued cash or equivalent that the bank has deposited with a central bank, plus the amount of already existing debt money the bank has on deposit. To illustrate this in a simple way, Let's imagine that a new bank has just started up and has no depositors yet. However, the bank's investors have made a reserve deposit of $1,111.12 of existing cash money at the central bank. The required reserve ratio is 9 to 1.